Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. And they, they basically accepted me back on a study, so I used to go in, pick a USB up on my day, uh, my week's release, pick it up on the way Thursday morning, and then go back to prison, work for three weeks with my USB, because I, I never really had a lot of reading materials and we had no access to the internet, so it was extremely hard. But I'd done that for three weeks and I'd come back out and go back into university and hand my USB, get my next USB and go back. And then when I got released to prison in January 2010, Harry Watt allowed me to finish my studies as a full-time student on campus. A great believer in what will be, will be. I, I, you, you learn very quickly when you come out of prison. You, re, you do rely on other people to accept you. So if the SFA were going to accept me, they were going to accept me, there wasn't a lot I could do about that. So I was, I was fairly comfortable with it. Obviously the players were probably a wee bit more apprehensive, the staff probably a little bit more apprehensive from my family. But I, I was I was fairly relaxed about it, if I'm honest. And after the game, I can remember we're all, we're all in the change room, the champagne's open, the boys are popping it, and we're all singing and dancing. Then we got taken away to do media, and it was 15 minutes, and I swear to God, for that moment onwards, all I'd done was worry about in the Premier League. I need to go and get players. How am I going to survive in the Premier League? So you never actually really got a chance to enjoy the experience because all you were thinking about was being in the Premier League. <laughs> Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons and on this week's show, absolutely delighted to be joined by another David. We've got a right fit and proper person and Livingston first team manager, Mr David Martindale on the show. David, thanks for coming on, mate. No, no problem at all. Uh, delighted to do so. Nah, I appreciate your time, mate. I know you've got a busy schedule, so thanks again. Uh, first of all, we'll have to say, what a start to your, your manager, managerial career at Livingston. First 14 games undefeated, obviously it would ideally have been 15, but you couldn't have really asked for a better start, mate, could you? No, I think uh, when I took over the job, you've obviously set yourself many, many goals, many targets, and you're thinking, like, win a couple of games, see how it goes. And uh, But to go 14 unbeaten is incredible. I think it was 10, sheet, 10 clean sheets in that. 14 game run so testament to the players and the staff at the club I think it's a phenomenal achievement Yeah I mean you experienced your first defeat unfortunately the weekend there you went down to a strong St Johnston side uh, 2-1 at home does tasting defeat now make you even more determined to, to get back to winning ways? To be honest David um, I've been here for that, seven years probably been part of the first team squad properly as an assistant manager for five years so that you take the defeats in the chin, you try not to get too, it's an old cliche, but you try not to get too high when you're winning games, you try not to get too low when you're losing games, so I just focus on the next game and I try and, I try and do that with the players, I say forget it, it's done, you can't, you can't change the past, you can only shape the future, put it to bed, forget about it, we dealt with it, move on and obviously we were meant to have a game tonight, it's been called off, but uh, Hamilton on Wednesday was the focus, so now yeah. you just got on it. So let's go right back, take us right back You never played at a pro level But you were in academies at the likes of Mullerwell Rangers as a youngster You also had trials at Dundee United I believe as well Looking back, do you think maybe you could have carved yourself out a career as a pro? Yeah, probably I think I had the ability to be honest I just never had the mindset I, Again, growing up, where I grew up I was kind of caught up in We all played football in the streets You all played football with your pals You played against the other schemes That type of thing So I was kind of caught up in all that And I probably wasn't educated enough to understand that the ability I had probably could have done something with it. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it could have done a wee bit better, to be honest. I mean, as you did get older, you played at a, a junior level. Um, what was your memories playing? I mean, it's the likes of Linlithgow Rose and West Calder, I yeah. think it was as well. Yeah, how was it playing in that rank? It was good. It was a good standard. I played, I think I played most levels of the juniors. So, 2004... I moved to Pumferson. It was quite a lot. I knew, I knew quite a lot of the junior players, and oh, come, they've been asking me for years. Do you want? Come on, come on, come on! You're too good to play amateur. Come on! So eventually, it's, it's common knowledge, but I got arrested in 2004. So basically, a light bulb moment, so to speak, changing my life. So do you know what? I said I'm going to stop playing with my pals at amateur level, and I'm going to I'm going to try and enjoy whatever time I've got left before I go to prison. And I went to Pumphersen Juniors and I was there for two years and it was a fantastic, fantastic 
squad of players and you were playing against all different levels of players because there's some right good players at that level and it's just for lack of discipline, lack of mindset, the mental ability has probably let them down, not not the technical ability, there's a lot of, lot of good players like at that time I'm trying to think Steve so ones that maybe slip through the net, sorry, that sorry to interrupt, David. There's yeah. the ones that maybe slip through the net that are playing at that level that probably could have. Have you, have you got a wee bit of knowledge of junior senior self? Uh, my goalkeeping coach at Haddington Athletic, which right. was juniors obviously into uh, uh, East of Scotland now, yeah. You'll, you'll know Chris King then, don't you? Yes, Kingy? very well. Yeah. Kingy, Kingy came to us at Pumbles and, and I, 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 I swear to God, still to this day, I wish, I wish I could have got a hold of Kingy earlier. He was still quite young when he came to us, maybe 22 something along the lines and um, that was two forties, maybe a wee bit younger than that actually and he was phenomenal I still don't know what foot Kingy kicks with and I've been in the senior ranks now that's me been in seven years and hand in heart I can honestly say he's up there with some of the most technically gifted players that I've ever played with and I've I've ever had physically seen in training Mm -hmm. it was uh, Chris King it was uh, Stephen Payne Stephen Payne had been playing with Aberdeen the year before. And so I was, we Chris Geddes, we Chris Geddes. I was yeah. a lot of very, very good football players. And we had a lot of senior players that had played, like Callum Mullen. Callum was your sweeper. Callum had played at Hibs for years and years. So we had a very good squad and a very good mix of players. But Kingy, Kingy for me was one that stood out, to be honest. I thought he was a fantastic talent. Yeah, I mean, I think he's actually involved at Newton Green Star now as well. And yeah. our, our gaffer at Haddington, Joe Hamill, who played at Livingston and yeah, uh, obviously yeah. Hearts, Leicester City, he speaks very highly of Kingy as well. Says obviously yeah. the ability as well is frightening. Frightening, frightening. Like, as, um, when I came into Livingston, obviously I had the privilege of playing with wee Pats, wee Scott Pittman, because I played in midfield with wee Scott at Broxburn. And I took Scott along and I look back and I go, I wish I, I wish I had managed to get a hold of players like Kingy and that, that standard, because I think I'd have got the best out of them. Also had Stephen Weir, you remember Green Weir's brass? Yeah. Steven, Steven uh-huh. at the players that you've came through the ranks with in some of these junior teams, I think as a good as a as a right good handful who could have probably played top level Scotland if they had a better mindset. Yeah, I mean, you touched on, obviously, before we answered that question, the, the incident in 2004 when you knew you were going to be going to jail. Yeah. Something you've spoke quite open about, which is quite refreshing. Do you, do you recall that moment, like you said, I think you quoted that, that light bulb moment where you thought, like, something really has to change now. Do you remember that time? Yeah, 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 of course I do. It was lying in the prison cells in London Road. It was Easter weekend, April 2004. We were arrested on the Friday morning, appeared at court on the Tuesday afternoon, and... Day four days. I knew I had to change my life. And I, I, for that moment onwards, I think when I got a release and I was on bail on the Tuesday, I can't remember the exact date, but we got out on the Tuesday. And for that moment onwards, I managed to enrol in a university degree at Heriot Watt University. And I basically cut all ties with the amateur ranks because I wanted to go and try. And I knew I could maybe be out, I could be free for the next six months, 12 months, 18 months. You don't obviously go to prison straight away. So I knew I was going to have a bit of time in my hands, but living life in limbo, so to speak. So I wanted to make the most of it, and I signed up junior football, and I signed up to study at Heriot Watt University, and I never got in prison till October 2006. So I'd done both for two and a half years after getting arrested. Yeah, you made a start to that course at uni as well. How important was it upon your release that you finished that course? Was that a, a, a main aim for you? Yeah, yeah, it gave me something to hang on to as well because I'd completed so many modules in a two and a half year spell. But it was at 2009, I was on, I don't know, you might not be familiar with the system, but I was in a, I was in prison, which is a open estate, it's called. So right. you go out for a prison, you go out of prison for a week and you go back for three weeks. Every three weeks you go out for a week. So when I was, it was 2009, I went back into Herit Watt and had a meeting with a, professors and the rectors at Harriet Watt and they, they basically accepted me back on a study so I used to go in, pick a USB up on my day, uh, my week's release, pick it up on the way Thursday morning and then go back to prison, work for three weeks with my USB because I, I never really had a lot of reading materials and we had no access to the internet so it was extremely hard but I'd done that for three weeks and I'd come back out and go back into university and hand my USB, get my next USB and go back and then when I got released for prison in January 2010, 
Harry Watt allowed me to finish my studies as a full time student on campus. So that was absolutely huge. It gave me gave me a wee bit of light at the end of the tunnel, but also also gave me something to focus on. And yeah. I knew if I could get my university degree, it would open up all the opportunities for me. Yeah, well, you graduated with a two point one with honours as well. Is is that the path you thought you would continue to go down down that sort of project yeah. management? Yeah, yeah. I've always I've always been kind of quite good construction wise. I've always quite good with my hands, so to speak, and building stuff. So yeah, I did. I thought I thought that's where my career would take um, my you know, my career, my my life going forward would take me. Yep. So, what was your involvement in football upon your release? Like you say, you got released and you you finished your your university course. How did you get back involved in football? I came out and I've, all all my friends. I kept all the friends that I'd met when I was playing junior football, and they were all still involved at all different levels. Some were involved with Broxburn Athletic. Some were involved with Whitburn Juniors in the Super League. Yep. Broxburn Athletic were in the league below, and I managed to go along to Whitburn Juniors played in the Super League, I think, for six months and at the end of that season went back, went to Broxburn where I went in as a player coach. So it's actually Scott Pittman's dad, Stevie Pittman, you probably know Stevie. Yeah. Um, Stevie that brought me in. I've been good pals with Stevie for 20, 25 years. Is that where you got the taste for football management back at Broxburn? Is that your first taste of it? I try to help Pitts out because if you know Pitts, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, he's some man. But yeah, <laughs> When I was a player coach with Stevie McElhone and uh, Stevie Pittman, and at the end of that year, I think we got promoted to the Super League, and Stevie McElhone had said, look, work's taking over, kids are kids are taking up a lot of my time here, so I'm going to take a step back, and I, I basically, from a coach, became the assistant manager with Stevie Pittman, and we done quite well in the Super League that year. You had Newton Grange were in the Super League that year, actually, when Lifko rose, and that was just before, that was maybe a couple of years before you had the breakaway to the Lowland League. So mm-hmm. the East Super League was probably still, the East and the West Super League were probably the best fifth tier, if you want to call that, in Scotland. They were probably the, the best levels to be in at that at that stage and before the Lowland League. So when did the step come to get involved in Livingston? Am I right in saying John McGlynn maybe assisted in that? No, John was the manager at the time. So right. what happened was my pal, again, you might know Bully McPhee. Bully played for East Fife and that. He played a lot of junior football. Bully worked with the charity partner of the Livingston Football Club, the West Lothian Youth Foundation. Bully worked with the big lottery, but he was seconded to the West Lothian Youth Foundation. It was about working in the community stuff. Right. So Bully had a day-to-day involvement with Livingston Football Club because they shared the same premises, the same... T- uh, shared the same training area and Bully said look Livingston are really struggling I'm speaking to it was a guy called Neil Rankin who was in here at the time and Neil Neil was I think he was part owner or he was something along the lines he had a lot of control at the football club and I had a couple of coffees with Neil and he said look you want to come in and volunteer you're more than welcome come in so I thought well why not I've got an opportunity to come in I had a meeting with John McGlynn through Neil and John said look Quite happy for you to come in, and I came in for maybe I. John was only there for six months. To be honest, after that, came in, picked cones up, picked balls up. Then John asked me to do it. I'd done it, and I, I sat, I sat and watched, watched for a far so to speak. I had no involvement in the picking the team or any player recruitment, none of that. But John let me come in the dugout on a Saturday. He let me come to training, and I had a good relationship with all the staff and all the players, and that's that's kind of where it all started. That's amazing. So you, you did, you worked through the ranks at Livy, you, you were a volunteer like you say, you went on to coaching, to assistant manager where you spent quite a time to now be manager. Obviously we've touched on your past convictions but recently you had to show the SFA that you were fit and proper to do the job mate. What sort of emotions were you going through leading up to that decision? I wasn't really, I, I wasn't too fussed about it because I'm a, a great believer in what will be will be. I, like, yeah. You learn very quickly when you come out of prison, you, re, you do rely on other people to accept you. So, if the SFA were going to accept me, they were going to accept me, there wasn't a lot I could do about that. So, I was, I was fairly comfortable with it. Obviously, the players were probably a wee bit more apprehensive, the staff probably a little bit more apprehensive than my family. But I, I was I was fairly relaxed about it, if I'm honest. I bet the supporters were a bit nervous as well. I, 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 
I would imagine so. I'd imagine so. But how, how is it without them in the st- in the stadium? Because you, you normally buzz off them, but nah, it's not great. We're used to playing in empty stadiums, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> we've not got the biggest uh, season ticket fan base. But uh, it's it's not the same, and especially we're going through what you'd call it's it's quite a, a rosy period at the club. We're doing quite well, you know. Not to be able to share it with the fans is it is extremely frustrating, but. You probably got to flip that and see how lucky we are to be playing football because there's guys like yourselves that mm-hmm. your, your leagues have all been stopped, but we're fortunate enough to we're still being able to go and do the job we love. We're going to be able to go out and go to work every day. So the fans not being here, it's it's not great. But flip it round and at least we're we're allowed to go and do the job we love. And I think it's helping the fans for the mental health aspect. They're still on a Saturday; they can still turn into the the pay-per-view, they're still watching the interviews, they're still following the team, the players, social media. So I think without that, I think society would be a lesser place, if I'm honest, because it gives us all something to grasp onto just now. Yep, absolutely. Um, like we said, you had to present a case to the SFA. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in this, just in doing research, no, I was speaking to you. Am I right in saying that Professor Phil Scraton assisted you with, with that case? If anybody doesn't know who he is, he was he, he played a huge part in fighting the, for the rights of the families that faced injustice for the Hillsborough disaster. Um, is that correct, or have I got my facts wrong with no, that no, one, David? You're right. So I think I've done a feature on Football Focus, and obviously Football Focus doesn't just hit the Scottish market, I think it hits a British a British audience. Yeah. I've done a wee bit and Professor Screeton got in touch with the club and said, look, I'm all for rehabilitation and I want to put, do you mind if I put a case together as as an endorsement to the SFA? So I Phil Screeton put a, a letter of endorsement together. And anyway, although he didn't know me and he didn't know the club, I think he'd followed the story and he wasn't too concerned about my past because rehabilitation shouldn't really take into account the offence, if that makes sense, because it's, it's rehabilitation. It's what you do when you get released from prison, not what you've done previously mm-hmm. through that. Yeah. So he was quite happy to do a recommendation to the SFA, and I'll be forever grateful for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, what was refreshing about your story, David, is obviously, like myself, you've got a number of current, obviously, coaches that are maybe making their way through the, the, the SFA pathway, if you like, whether that be at boys club level, academy level, amateur, junior or senior. The, they're working their way through the pathway. The, the, the look that maybe, oh, you can only be a, a high-class manager in the game if you've played at a senior level. I mean, the David Martindale story says otherwise, doesn't it, mate? Yeah, Dave. Sorry, somebody just... Sorry, mate. Uh, no, no, definitely. I think I think football's taking a it's taking a turn where you're you're looking there's a lot more academic coaches coming into the game. And what I mean by that is if you look at me, just use a couple of examples. Jurgen Klopp, Jurgen Klopp's not played the game at a, a top, top level. Yep. Um even Sir Alex Ferguson to a certain degree never played the game at a top, top level. He did, he did play I think it was Rangers potentially, but he never had a long spanning career at mm. top, top level. Jose Mourinho and AVB, there's a there's a lot of managers if you look through now, and I think football's changing, and it's a lot more academic now, and there's a lot more analyst, analytic, tactical knowledge in the game. So I think it, it does open opportunities for all our coaches. Where is that? You, before you had to, you know, where's he played? He's played top level, and he came into coaching. But I think you've seen over the years that there's a lot more academic coaches coming in or a different kind of intellect, if that makes sense, whereas uh, maybe someone who's played top-level football <clears throat> since they were 15 year olds, maybe their skill set's in football and football only, but they've not got that social skill set that I think now you need in a modern environment. I think yep. football is changing and it's diversifying, and it's a different type of coach that's needed. I don't think your old-school mentality of coaching works now, if I'm honest. You've got a I do believe the kids coming through the system are all visual learners. They're stuck with their phones. They've been stuck with their phones for maybe 10, 15 years. We probably, maybe not yourself, but me. I never had the luxury of having a mobile phone when I was growing up. I wasn't. Everything I learned was either probably through a book or doing it, getting shown how to do it. Whereas now you've got a different level type of football player and they learn a different way. And I think it's a lot more academic now. 
Mm -hmm. No, I absolutely agree with that. And like you say, like there's maybe some players that have maybe played from 15 year old that have went to the top of the game and feel like they've maybe got an entitlement to go into the managerial role. Whereas, I mean, that's certainly not the case. You only have to look quite close to home, maybe the likes of Hibs, if you like, maybe Frank Sozzi. What a player he was. But when he, he actually got the managerial role at Hibs, he didn't succeed. And he said it was because the vision that he had in his head, he couldn't relay that to his players. And as long as you've got a philosophy and you can get that across to the players and they buy into that, you're on to a winning way, surely, David, yeah? Yeah, there's a lot more to it, I think. Like, there's a lot more to it now. Like, you're coaching on the, coaching on the, the grass, like, say, I know folk are going to say you've got an Astro Park and you get all that, but coaching on the grass, like, say, right, you're 90 minutes a day. You, I'm at the club 10, 12 hours a day, and it's what you're doing with the rest of your time. You're a social worker, you're a friend, you're a father. There's a lot more to the job now than what I think was previously. Society's changed, it's a lot more politically correct, so you're dealing with a lot more instances in football. There's a lot more variables in football that make the job that little bit more difficult, whereas I think previously you were maybe coaching on the grass, playing football. There's a lot more to it now, I think. Yeah, I mean, others might look at your story, David, that maybe themselves have had maybe previous convictions or such in the past. As a positive example, as someone that has went through the rehabilitation stage, turned their life around, is that something that maybe gives you a little bit of satisfaction knowing that you're maybe a slight role model to these kind of people? I never used to see that, if I'm honest, but since I got the manager's job, there's been a lot of positive, positive mail and pos positive social media uh, messages and stuff like that. So, yeah, I do see that now, but... A wee bit disappointed that it took, I think that's my seventh year at Livingston, it took six and a half years before my case was seen as a positive. The six and a half years previously, I've got to admit, it wasn't a positive. It was never seen or portrayed as a positive. So it's nice yeah. to see that changing. I mean, you, you were awarded with Manager of the Month for January. Uh, Scott Robinson won your players, got Player of the Month as well. Did you ever think when you were working your way through the ranks at Livingston, like you say, you started out putting cones down, progressed up to a coach, to assistant manager, did you ever think you'd be picking up accolades like that? No, no I didn't think I'd be sitting here speaking to yourself or sitting yeah. here as a manager at Livingston Football Club. But what I would say, I, I never said, when I stepped in the door at Livingston, I've never ever... I never had a target of what to be the manager one day, I want to be the assistant manager one day. I just came in and done my job and if somebody what needed help, I'd go and help them. And I've done that since day one and I say that to the players all the time. Don't come into Livingston Football Club with aspirations not to be here. Come in, do your job, work hard and what will be will be. It will follow you but you get a lot of, a lot of players and maybe even some coaches now, now, they're trying to fast track everything. They try and get there too quickly. I'm a great believer in go in, do your job, and what will be will be. And if you're working hard and you're doing your job properly, I think opportunities will come your way. So for day one, I've never, never for one minute came in and said, oh, I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to do this, I want to do that. I've just came in and worked away. And I've been honest, I've been open with everybody when I've been in the building. And I think I think that's something that the players, the players can relate to is the openness and the honesty. Because I think you'll agree, even when I was playing football, I used to hate it. And the manager maybe brought you in and said, I'm just going to rest you today. You've got a game at the weekend. You wasn't resting. You were getting dropped because you were you were poor the game before. And I'm big on, for the boy to know that he's maybe being dropped through lacky form or not doing, you need to tell them what they're doing. How can they do it better and what is it they're doing wrong? And I think that honesty has always stood me in good stead throughout my time at Livingston. It can become yeah. across as quite brutal at times, but... I think the boys respect that. I mean, I was talking to a very close friend of mine and, and he, he said this and 
straight away that it just clicked for me. It's, it's quite, I mean, your story and Livingston are, are actually quite similar. If you look at the club as Livingston as a whole started out as Ferranti Thistle, I think, a works team for an electronics yeah. company in Edinburgh. They then moved on to be Meadowbank Thistle, working their way through the ranks. They moved through to Livingston, rebranded, started from the very bottom, worked their way up. Obviously, they had some ups and downs along the way. They won the League Cup, they got into Europe, they then had to start again right at the bottom and again, like I say, worked their way back up to the club they are today. In a cheesy way, if we kind of look at maybe your story as well, David, it's been quite a similar journey. You started at the bottom of Scottish football on the academy level, worked up to juniors. You started as a coach at Livingston, worked your way up there as well. And now you've progressed through the ranks and you're the, the manager of the club. Um, there's been Hollywood movies that haven't quite had storylines like that, mate. Um, it must be a great sense of achievement to know where you are just now and how successful you're being. I find it hard to accept the success, to be honest, because I don't know how you are, but when I win a game of football, that for 15 minutes you've got that adulation with the boys in the changing room and see straight after it, all you can think about is the next game. And I think there's a fear of failure, especially in the, especially in the professional ranks in football, because you've got social media now plays a big part in the football and there's fans and fear of failure is mad <laughs> my driving motivation if I'm honest how like I don't want to fail the next game and that's how we kind of got the philosophy take one game at a time mm -hmm. so it's very very hard to sit here and pat yourself in the back but I think there's a period at the end of the season where you're maybe going away on holiday with the family hopefully mm -hmm. but you can sit back and you can look you can reflect back but I don't think you'd really get a chance to do that during the season if I'm honest and I can remember getting promoted to the Premier League Last game, we're a goal up. We're go a goal up on a uh, goal difference. On, we're in the second leg at Fur Hill, and Keegan Jacobs scores really, really early into the second half, which puts his two goals up. And I can remember turning round to Hoppy, and I was about forty minutes to go, and we're looking at each other, going, "We could maybe go to the Premier League here," but at no point in that journey, beating Dungeon United at Tannadice, I think we drew with them at home. Beating Partick Thistle at Livingston, at no point in that journey did we ever turn around and speak about it with one another or with the players. Yeah. And it wasn't to Keegan's goal went in and it gave us a two goal advantage that we went, hey, we, we might be going to the Premier League. And that, that was a wee bit of a surreal moment, that moment there. But it lasted yeah. for a couple of minutes and then all you were doing was concentrating on the game. And after the game, I can remember we're all, we're all in the change room and the champagne's open, the boys are popping it and we're all singing and dancing then we got taken away to do media and it was 15 minutes and I swear to God for that moment onwards all I'd done was worry about we in the Premier League I need to go and get players how am I going to survive in the Premier League so you never actually really got a chance to enjoy the experience because all you were thinking about was being in the Premier League <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got you've got a huge game coming up, obviously on the twenty eighth of uh, twenty eighth of this month. Sorry, it's against uh, the team that, that obviously beat you the weekend, St Johnston. Are you looking to get a bit of payback against them in the in the Betfred Cup final on the twenty eighth? Oh, of course I am. Of course I am. But I think I, as I've played each other three times this year, and we've won two and they've won one. So always try and balance that off in the Premier League. So we've picked up six points. They've picked up three. So if we can keep doing that in most of our opponents or most of the teams round about us. You're always going to be in a good position come the end of the season. But yeah, it's a it's a one-off game and I do believe, I think form goes out the window, if I'm honest. I think form will go out the window. It's a one-off game. And there is a lot of variables during a football match that alter the course of a football match. Like you could go in with suspensions, injuries, a refereeing decision, a moment of madness for one of your own players, a sending off, a penalty. So there's a lot of different variables that are out with your control that you probably you probably need to fall in your favour on the game. On the yeah. game. I mean, as you said, you, you take every game as it comes, week by week, game by game. Have Have you started maybe making preparations for that one already? Though at the end of the month. No, no, no. I don't know let the boys think about that. I think we've we've got big games coming up. If you start focusing on that and you lose a wee bit of your focus off the league games for. For all you know, you could be sitting, nobody remembers this uh, final loser, so you could be lost a cup and you could have maybe lost six, nine points in the meantime in the lead up to that. So don't talk about it. We'll talk about it in, after the game, the game before, if that makes sense. We'll talk, uh, the game after, sorry. We'll talk about it, but no, nah, I don't let them lose focus on the next game, which oh, is yeah. the most important game. 
Absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned obviously there's no fans in the stadium. If if you're successful on the 28th, it's there'll, there'll not be any sort of parade around the town either with a cup, will there? I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think that would be advised through social distance. But no in Livingston, it'll be snowing anyway, so <laughs> nobody will want to come out. No, no, but that's the thing as well. We built have like a, a proper party with the, the boys as well, and appreciate that. It's, it's, it's no, the world we live in, mate. Uh, no, we've got a game. We've got a game. We fall. Do we play? I think we play the Wednesday. We play right. the Wednesday after Sunday's final, so nah. And see, to be fair, I must say in the change room, mate, it's a different culture now in the a professional change room. Well, I've definitely found that in my time at Livingston. You struggle to find a player that actually drinks alcohol. Yeah. Like you struggle to find that now. They, they're, they're ultimate professionals, and we need all the fine margins going in our favour. Obviously, we've not got the best of budgets, so. We try and recruit well boys that live their life right away for the football club. Do you know what I mean? So there's no even offering a drink to the boys who probably wouldn't thank you for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do a podcast on a Monday night as well on Scottish football with another couple of guys. Um, we, we get comments come through because we're live and we do it. And there's a, a big following of other teams that would love to have you in charge or as your gaffer, Pri primarily at the moment, Celtic probably because what's going on with Neil Lennon and such. Oh, we take David Martindale any time. We take right. him any time. Um, how how do you react to those sort of accolades when people come back and big you up like that because of the what you're producing on the park at Livingston? I don't, I don't actually look at social media that much or read any social media, but I, it's what it is. I mean, I could be the flavour of the month for this month, but you could go and lose a couple of games and then nobody's wanting you. <laughs> so you take it with a pinch of salt, don't you? Let's be honest. That's what it is. I know you're a busy man, David. I won't keep you much longer, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Martindale. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. And all the best for the 28th, mate. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Cheers, cheers.